build a winning culture. So uh, today is one of my favorite topics. Uh, matter of fact, probably one of the more challenging topics to communicate because a lot of people kind of have this idea of they, they hear culture, it's, oh yeah, culture, I get it. But then you try to define it, you try to put words to it, you try to talk about how to impact it, how to steer it, what's wrong with it. It becomes much more challenging, complex, nuanced. So today, I'm going to hope, hopefully, if I'm successful, make it a little more easy to understand kind of what culture is and give you some uh, guidance on what you can do to, uh, to impact culture, all right? So uh, we are video, starting the last session, we're videotaping these. My goal is to upload these. People who don't come, if you don't come to one, we can either Dropbox it or something so you can have access to it. So if you wanted to send somebody to it, hey, check this out. So uh, we're going to try to build kind of a content library. So that's the goal going forward. All right. Um, not super high tech, but high tech enough, right? All right. So let's dive in here. How to build a winning culture. I want to, <laughs> I'm going to read this because you probably can't read my handwriting. Let's just define culture. This is um, probably the most widely accepted definition in the business world of culture, going back to 1960, a fellow named Edgar Schein, who was a professor at MIT, the Sloan School of Business. And he, he said this, culture, this is organizational culture, right, is a pattern of shared basic assumptions that the group learned as it solved its problems of external adaptation and internal integration that has worked well enough to be considered valid and therefore taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. Okay? So just let that digest a little bit. So kind of put that in your own words. Just what's a takeaway? What's that mean to you? Culture is what? Just kind of fill in the blank. What's that mean to you? What do you get from that? It's, how, it's, it's kind of an approach that we all use to deal with problems. Okay. So how we approach a problem, um, if it works, I share that, and then and on our team, <coughs> there's some cultures, right? Our team, department, company, organization, and then over time, it's how we all tend to look or perceive or approach a problem. What else? How would you add to that? What's a takeaway on this definition? Well, it's really, I guess, it's based on experience, uh, some failures, some successes. It also has the seed of destruction. If you don't change with time, change your processes, um, it could work against you. Okay. Mm -hmm. The experiential part, I think, is really key. You can't just have a class. You know, you can say, here's the history. You know, like where I go to church, they have like the history of the church and the, you know, kind of what we believe kind of thing. But that's, that just kind of gives you knowledge, you know. And knowledge isn't all of it. Because it, it, you could say one thing and be another, right? And really, in regards to culture, it's much more important experientially what people are, are seeing and doing, viewing, all of that, all right? So I, I think the keys here are the external adaptations, how you meet customer expectations, how you succeed in the world, right? And the internal integration is how we get along together as people. And, and when we figure out what works, then we tend to stick with that, right? In, in the world of behavior modification, an owner or a leader you know, might reward what he or she perceives as what works, hey, way to go. Uh, and so they, they uh, positively reinforce the behavior that they think is right, and over time that becomes the way, right? There's a lot of books, the Disney way, the, the Walmart way. There's a lot of books about what their kind of cultural uh, experience has become uh, today. Southwest, a book called Nuts, is awesome. Uh, they wrote another book uh, called Guts later. The book Nuts is really fabulous in capturing what's unique about the Walmart culture. But before we kind of get into some outline here, um, I want to plant some seeds. So I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you this here this morning. Is I want you to think about as we're talking, what I'm hoping is our discussion is going to prop some things um, where you're thinking about your culture, where you work. 
uh, or a, an organization where you worked, where there is a, a, a values proposition, a values piece that you perhaps agreed with and liked a lot and embraced, that kind of what defined their culture, in your opinion, or maybe a values proposition or values piece that you thought was not 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 good, not acceptable to you. So I want this to become personal. I want you to see it right in your own experience where culture can be strong and positive and helpful, and maybe where, as Steve pointed out, it can be a negative aspect of a, an organization's culture. So I'm going to ask each of you to share here before we uh, finish at 10 o'clock. All right? So let's look at this, though. Um, this is the oldest known kind of, this is the first reference to what we refer to as culture today, anthro anthropologically speaking. Right? So a fellow named uh, Edward Tyler in 1871 said this, and this is like a textbook definition. Uh, culture, um, country's culture, a tribal culture, you know, uh, you know is, is a complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, customs, an S on that, and other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Just so, so my wife and I went to the Notre Dame game, Louisville Cardinals Notre Dame football game last fall. Right, this is awesome, awesome. We we uh, we got into the hotel late. I asked them where you know we could get something to eat and drink, and they told us about this pub just kind of a block away. So as luck would have it. A friend of mine, I don't know if you guys know Conway Stone, Conway was there right on like the front row. It was a Irish pub. I mean like a true, authentic Irish pub with three guys. One guy's playing like a woodwind, one guy's playing the, the guitar, and one guy's playing some sort of beatbox thing. And it was like so much fun. And he's it's sitting at a picnic, ta picnic table with his wife. And there's another young couple there. So we didn't really think anything about it. We went up and sat down. This young couple, he's from northern Italy which is, he's very German in his accent, so he's really, anyhow, he's from, and she's from Austria, and they, they're married, and he's uh, doing his, uh, some doctoral postdoc work at Notre Dame. We struck up a friendship, and they came down to Louisville for the Derby, and went to the Derby with us. It was fascinating having people in your home, having people sharing, you know, you know, in Kentucky, one of our traditions, right? I mean, we make a big deal out of the Derby, don't we? I mean, people probably say, because we party all week, right? I mean, we have gatherings and get-togethers. I mean, we put so much time and energy into this. Then we went on the Bourbon Trail. You know, we did all of these things that were uniquely Kentucky. We had these wonderful conversations about how our cultures were the same and how they were different. Matter of fact, they use this word that you don't hear it used very often in America. They, they describe my wife as so cosmopolitan. The only thing I'd think about in cosmopolitan, I wouldn't say Neapolitan, right, is the ice cream, right, the, the, the multiple flavors. But, you know, I looked it up because they described it as just someone who appreciates multiculturalism, you know, other cultures and so forth. So it's, it's obvious when we say that, that how people do things in Italy is very different, right? How they celebrate birthdays, how they celebrate a holiday, how they uh, value marriage or uh, faith or things like that are very different there. When you say why, it's well, it's, it's a combination of the behavior and attitudes of hundreds and hundreds of years, right? So organizations get to that same point because of the people that they hire and what their attitudes and behaviors are, and eventually that becomes the norm, right? And if you want to change the norms, you either have to change processes which sometimes moves people out who won't or can't meet the processes, or you've got to change the people out, right, in order to impact culture. So and I think it's it, we, we understand that countries have unique cultures, but Kmart and Walmart, distinct culture, right? I mean, you name GE and Ford, right? Microsoft and Apple. I mean, any kind of tech, there's all kinds of distinct cultures out there. And, and the founders have a lot to do with it, their leadership team, their hiring practices, their, their processes regarding you know, training, and so all those things are all impactful when it comes to culture. But I, let me give you my outline. So when I was thinking about this, I did a little research, 
And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to share <coughs> the table of contents of my, my current book project. I'm writing a book called Inspiring Talent. And it, 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 without saying culture, it really is all about culture. How do you build a culture that inspires people? Right? If, if, I'm a, if I'm really a go-getter, if I'm, I'm a guy that I really want to find a home where I can go and work for somebody, a part of some team, with some goal, and really get inspired, what does that look like? Right? So I'm going to share with you my table of contents and see if there's some good takeaways in it for you. All right? So here we go. So the, the four parts are simply this. There's a formational or foundational component to, to culture. We have to get the, that there's a basis, a foundation forward. Then we start forming the culture. So we've got the foundation. Now we kind of begin building the, the walls up, so to speak. And now we start choosing directions and how we're going to go, right? The processes that we're going to implement and, and the expectations that we're going to make of other people. And if we really do it right, we can get to this point where it's really transformational. Uh, a good example, I think, of transformational culture would be Southwest Airlines. If you, if you fly a lot and, and, and you want to get there on time and, and uh, your luggage there and, and really be treated warmly more often than not, can I get you to slide over that way? The camera's right behind you. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Production error. <laughs> we'll edit that out. <laughs> edit his big head out. <laughs> but, um, you know, Southwest is different. I mean, if you fly Delta or US Air, they're fine. They're good. But you go to YouTube and you see funny flight attendants and all that, it's not going to be Delta people. It's not going to be US Air people. It's one after another after another of Southwest people because part of their culture has always been to connect with the people, to, to engage the people. That book, Nuts, tells all kinds of wonderful stories about Southwest employees going above and beyond for their, their customers, right? It's just really, now you just don't hear that about Delta. You don't hear, now is, is Delta a bad airline? No, it's just Southwest is unique and their culture sets them apart, right? From their culture, the products become perceived differently. Right? Um, trying to think of his name. Totally blanked me. The founder of Southwest. Bert Keller. Yeah, Bert Keller. Her, Herb. Herb Keller. Herb. Herb Keller. Herb. Um, they were called the Love Airline early on, right? Yeah. And, and uh, I, I did a presentation years ago, and he said, you know, one of the things we want to do is we want to put our people first, not our customers, because if we put our people first, <clears throat> they'll put the customer first. He said, we're not in the airline business. We're in the customer service business, and we happen to use airplanes to make customers happy. Is that a unique take on the airline business? Right? I mean, it's pretty, pretty strong. That's what makes Southwest unique. The airplanes are the same. Matter of fact, for the longest time, they had DC-9s, which weren't like awesome, spacious, comfortable airlines. But they did other things better that set them apart. So foundationally. Herb Keller is a good person to begin with. The leader really sets the tone. This is especially true when you're small. If you have, you know, most people that are going to be in this, this session have fewer than 25, 50, you know, 100 employees. Now, if you think about this, the impact that a leader has on a small team of people is dramatic, right? And if you don't think you're having an impact, you're, you're deceiving yourself by your presence or by your absence, right? So, the tone that you're setting is in your values and your vision, all right? What you value, right, there's this natural tendency to hire and want to be around people that are like you. Just, I remember years ago, 29, 30 years old, we did a leadership conference and we're talking about hiring practices and one guy just, I'm, you know, when I hire salespeople, I try to hire uh, ex-athletes. Ex-athletes are competitive, you know, they're tough, they're persistent, they know what it takes to win. Well, guess who he was? <laughs> he was an ex-athlete, right? Way past his prime, but he liked being around jocks, ex-athletes, because they could talk football and sports and all that. And, you know, I'm not saying that's all completely wrong, but that's not enough, right? There's a lot of talent out there beyond just 
ex-athletes that he's going to be missing if that's his narrow focus. But that's his values and his vision, right? So when you're thinking about your culture, I think it begins with kind of, who are you? What do you value? Uh, when I'm working in a coaching arrangement with leaders, you know, I'll give them a, a list of 15, 20 values. And I'll just say, put these in priority order. You know? Think about, think about values right now. Think about, I've, I've got this question up here. Which values do you hold? Just put one down on a piece of paper. Something that is a, a non-negotiable. A non-negotiable to you. When you're in charge, in your company, if somebody did this, said this, violated this value, that'd be it. There's no conversation. You know, once I verify that it's true and it happened, it's done. So I don't care if they're my number one performer. I don't care if they're my worst performer. You know, if they're, if they're going to violate this particular value, all right, then, then we're done. So, so think about that. When you start really living by that, because what happens? What happens? We, we espouse a value, integrity. So you might put down integrity. I believe in integrity. And so we're chugging along. We've been in business five years, ten years. Our number one salesperson gets caught lying. And this person might be responsible for 40%, 50% of the business. So do we really have that value? Do we really believe that value? Or is what, what I call pretty words? Just pretty words on, a, on the wall somewhere. Because if we believe it, what are we going to do? You gotta live it. Go live it. What's living look like? Doing it every single day without yeah. fail. And what did we do with a salesperson that's 40, 50 percent of our business? Terminate them. Yeah. And I'll tell you, that sends the message that it's not just pretty words. Right? So many times, well, yeah, yeah, but mm -hmm. we should. So what we're saying with our actions is, it's not as important as I've tried to make it. And that sends a message that waters down that value, right? So people say, hmm, if I'm the best performer, I can get away with more. And you see a lot of that manipulation. I hear a lot of people say, well, that, that uh, employee's holding me hostage. They know how important they are. They know what, that they know all kinds of stuff about the system or processes more than I do. They know why I can't terminate them. My answer is, yes, you can. You just choose not to. And, and when we allow employees to have that kind of power over us, we basically have no values. There is no values, right? If values are guiding your organization, people are going to uh, either adhere to them and support them and live by them, or they're not going to be there. And, and I know that's simple to say out loud and much harder to do, but if you really believe in these values, that's how you live. Uh, give you a good example. I cut my teeth in the business world. Uh, I joined a uh, what became, the company name changed a couple, three times in seven years. When I first hired on with them, they were a uh, landmark community news out of Shelbyville. They, they were within a month spun off to be landmark target media. Then they became Trader Publishing, and now everybody knows them as Auto Trader Magazine, right? They were doing $30 million a year when I started, and within seven years they were doing $300 million. And they're over a billion dollar company for many years now. All right, so, so very values oriented company, strong culture, sense of who they were. Uh, Frank Batten owned the whole thing. One man owned the whole thing. Conrad Hall was our president. Um, every office, every property location was listed every month with uh, increases to budget, decreases to budget, you know, what our profit margins were. We saw how we compared with every office, every very performance-oriented company. How you perform, very transparent. You see you're the bottom, the middle, the top. One of the top five offices was Atlanta. Very successful GM. Word got out that this gentleman was verbally abusive, kind of yelling and screaming, using, you know, uh, curse words and that sort of thing to staff in front of staff, right? So he had a temper, right? That happens all the time across American business. I'm telling you, all the time. So it came out in some exit interviews. If you're not doing exit interviews, you're really missing the boat that, that this is what was going on. HR addressed it, kind of, you know, handled it. The GM or that person's regional addressed it. Within a few weeks, it happened again, terminated. 
This is one of the top five performing out of 85 offices. Top five in the country in terms of profitability, profit margin, all that. Terminated. Not because of performance. Values violation. Violated the culture. What message does that send to the rest of the leaders? So when you think about the leader, right, who are you? If you don't stand up for who you are and really look at it as non-negotiable, make them something more than pretty words, right, you're, you're never going to become what you want to become. But if you see it, right, and you say, what I believe is important, I want people to, to live it. I want, my, I want it to be a reflection of who I am. If we're 50 people or 100 people or 15 people, I want to look out there and say, they get it. They, they share what's important to me, right? So, so that's the beginning place, this foundational piece. And when you think about Walmart, you can't talk about Walmart without the years that Sam Walton was at the helm and the impact he personally made. You know, Sam would fly in on his helicopter, and every time until they, he couldn't keep up with it and he got too, too old, he would meet with his staff, shake their hands personally, sing the Walmart song with them, and do the Walmart dance <laughs> every time he opened a brand new store. And while he was doing that, they had already built a pen because his dogs traveled with him, and they pinned them in the parking lot while he was in there. He might have only been there for 30 minutes or an hour. But he took his dogs with him wherever he went, and he met them, he was personal, he, and, he, and the song is silly, but... It, it was part of their ritual, part of their tradition. You get on his helicopter and go, but you know what? It was Walmart. Walmart wouldn't be Walmart without his values and his vision, right? And, and well, that, that's a, I'm sure there's all kinds of books written about that. So we go to the next stage here, the formational. Being intentional. I, I want to encourage you to think about what you want your culture to be. Um, how do I want my people to perceive, right? How do I want my people to handle the customer? How do I want them to handle and treat each other? Right? If somebody is rude and, and uh, abusive but they're talented, do you permit that? Uh, if somebody is really nice and really sweet but not a high performer, do you permit that? I mean, what, where do you draw the line, right? When it comes to customers, you know, how, what do you allow? What do you permit? Because those become a part of who we are. So be intentional. When you see a violation, address it. When you see somebody, you know, living by your values, affirm it. You know, see it. And if you hold up, hold it high, and hold it strong, and hold it accountable, you can be it, right? And and that first group that you hire, those people closest to you, that first leadership team and how you replace those folks is critical to establishing a strong, positive culture company. All right. So, so we talked about the leadership team. The key words here are alignment and integration. So how do we recruit people? You know, we joke in the recruiting world, when I was a manager, sometimes companies would just you know, hold a mirror up and then fit fog the mirror when they breathe, you're in, right? And and what does that what's that say? This is a company that will take anyone. Are you the kind of company, have you worked for a place that would just hire anyone? Because that doesn't send a really great message. If I'm the anyone, it's like, well, that was awful easy. You know, they didn't really ask me any questions, they didn't, you know, hmm. I'm not sure I want to work here if I have high standards, right? I mean, maybe this is not for me. Or maybe it is for me. This is going to be great. I can coast. I can take it easy, right? It kind of depends on who I am. But my, 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 uh, if I'm responsible, if I'm the leader and part of this leadership team, how I treat people in the recruiting process is going to be their first impression of who I am. Do you keep your appointments? Right? Are you on time? Um... I remember going through a really cool training, and the goal, what this uh, trainer taught us, was to make your, your candidates feel extremely comfortable. So when we would go through a, a kind of a, you know, a recruiting process, we're interviewing lots of folks, we'd have a cooler, or small refrigerator in the interview room, and we'd have it stocked full of all the kind of most common beverages, you know, to try to make people comfortable, right? 
here's a beverage, you know, just relax, we just want to get to know you. You know, that's kind of a good vibe, right? People like being treated with courtesy and kindness, right? If I'm going to be late, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to call you, text you, let you know I'm going to be 10 minutes late. I'm going to treat you with courtesy because that's how I treat all my employees. It's not just you because you're new. You'd be surprised how many stories I hear. Those of you that know me, you know, a lot of the business I do is in my recruiting business. And I think that gives us a unique insight into organizations as a whole because why do people want to leave their company? Well, a lot of it has to do with, with this right here. One lady told me, I've been working for this company for one year, right? And they interviewed me. It was really a neat company. I was really excited about the job. And on day one, they met with me and said, oh, yeah, you know that job we told you about? That's not the job we're giving you. We're going to give you this job. Same pay and everything, but we're putting you over here. I said, how do you guys do business? No conversation. No what do you think. You know, if you're coming here, is this job okay with you? Is that how you do business from here on? Oh, yeah, we're just going to do stuff, and we're not going to ask you. We're not going to tell you. We're just going to do it. And you know what? That's how they were. So what she learned that day was who they were. And that was a part of their values. They did not have an alignment in their behavior with what they espoused in their mission or value statement. It was not integrated, right? How, how they handle people, how they communicate with people. How do you discipline people? The most common thing I hear that is just, it's just crazy, uh, a guy called me two weeks ago. I've known this guy, and I've worked for him in a, in a consultant and recruiting role, and, and uh, he wanted to have lunch because he wanted me to help coach him uh, on, a, on a specific employee challenge. Then he calls me and says, oh, they let me go. I got an evaluation three months ago, perfect score, perfect number, all great evaluation, no warning, no write-up, no nothing, they let me go. You know, I said I want to do it well. How's that happen? How's that happen? There's no integration of policies and procedures into our values. You know, you can't have a strong culture company without understanding that what you do has to align with what you believe is important. If you're holding a value, well, hi, hey, we love our people, we treat our people, we communicate with our people, and then you behave that way, they just, yeah, 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 yeah. You're never going to be what you dreamed or hoped one day that you would be, all right? When the focus is on hiring the who, right? And a, and a good to great really nails it on this aspect. You know, first who, then what, right? And the who implies that I have this sense of who's going to fit well with my company. And if you have that sense, that means you've probably done some homework, you're introspective, you're pretty self-aware, right? And so you're getting, yeah, that person would fit well. You might be out to eat, and the, and the, the wait person, wait staff person might just be, oh, yeah, come talk to me. I want to hire you. I have a guy that's uh, a, an attorney who does financial, uh, kind of elder care stuff. And he hired one of the baristas at uh, Starbucks because he went in there every day for, like, years and he just loved her personality. He loved the way she treated him, the way she treated all the other customers. And he said, you happy here? Would you, would you like to come see? And now she's on a staff, and she's doing great. You know, you find people a lot of different ways if you're looking and know who you're looking for. Not everyone fits every culture, right? Uh, I've got one client that's very entrepreneurial. They're kind of a holding company. They buy companies low. And they're not about flipping them. They're about really building them up. So they want everyone to be on kind of a profit sharing. They want everyone to be thinking profit. And so there's a certain amount of pressure. There's a certain amount of expectation. Even on the HR manager, it's like, hey, you can make 25 30% bonus, you know, in addition to your salary. How many HR managers get a 20 25 30% bonus on profit? 99.9% don't, right? But they want everyone thinking the same way because that's one of our values, how to, is how to make money, how to streamline, make things more efficient. So it takes an entrepreneurial person, regardless of the field, to fit well into that culture. I love this. I don't know who said this first. I'm not going to take credit. But hire for what you can't train. And, and you know, we say that out loud. So, so I've said it, I've read it. What's that mean to you? Tell me what that means to you. I think 
it takes it does take knowing the the who know it just like you just said. We just hired a young lady um, a week ago. Uh, she just started this week, two weeks ago. We hired her, and um, she's got that thing you cannot train. She has that spark. She's curious. She's um, just got a lot of great qualities. Just the kind of young lady that's going to elevate everyone else around her. So those are things you can't train, and that's an internal uh, thing she's got. And you could probably learn some of it, but she does it very naturally and is, you know, just going to be a great hire for us, for sure, down the road. And she's the kind of person we want to begin to bring in. So I think, you, I think you, it sounds cliche, but I think you kind of know it when you see it. Yeah. <clears throat> but you do have to be looking, you have to have an idea. I like what you said a minute ago, Michael. You've, you've got to have an idea of what the who looks like. I mean. Otherwise, you're just kind of hiring anybody. You're sort of looking for warm bodies. Well, really, 90% plus don't think about the who. Right. They think about the resume. Yeah. Matter of fact, the recruiting world just says, here's some resumes. All these people have done the job you're looking to do. The one you need to fill, these 20 people, they can do this <coughs> job because they've done it. So hire one of these people. And, and they're not even addressing this sense of values, this sense of leader fit or values fit. You know, fit with the leader is critical, fit with the, the leadership team's values, right? And they're not even addressing that. It's amazing. The whole recruiting world is totally de detached from this whole idea. And yet it's the most critical one. If you're trying to build a team, it's about the who. The who is the qualitative things like character, values, you know, you describe somebody who wants to take initiative, somebody who's got some enthusiasm. Have you ever gone to class and like, here's how to be enthusiastic, you know? Here's how to be, you know, high character. You either are or you are. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's inside. It's inside. I, uh, in retrospect, you know, it's interesting. I've been on my own for 15 years, and, uh, but I was always on my own. Ever since I was out of college, and I went to college a thousand miles away. So, you know, I really, I left home at 17, went to UK, then I went to Tampa. So really since I'm 18, I've been on my own, right? In sales, my boss was never in town. When I was a GM, there was my boss. I've never been as a, a part of a team. You know, I've always kind of been independent, right? That's a value of mine. I, I didn't learn that really clearly until the last several years. It's like independence is a huge driver for me. So if you put me into a group of folks where I have to kind of vanilla things, I gotta, I gotta be one of the many, it, yeah, it's just, you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's just not who I am. And that's what's important is to figure that out. Um, I had a guy tell me yesterday, I'm recruiting for a controller position. And the guy said, he's kind of like you, Al. He said, uh, you know, I, I love to come in, work three, six months, and get something fixed and, and, uh, and turned around. I just don't want to be the guy, you know, for three, four, five years. He needs to know that about himself. He says, I lose interest. I like the challenge. I like the excitement of the turnaround. But once that's done,